desire to do. Is that not right? And I realize that especially in some of our elderly people, it's difficult for them. But uh, we need never omit God and every opportunity that we can come together to worship the Lord together. Uh, there may come a time in our not too distant future that every time that you have congregated and gathered yourselves together as we do uh, a couple of times at least a week there may come a time in our future that we will be grateful for all those times that we've come together for the memories of those times and so anyway we're just happy to be here this morning and be uh, in the Lord's house during a sermon two teenage girls were giggling <clears throat> and disturbing others the pastor stopped his message to announce someone here is not getting much out of this message the girls took the hint and quieted down. And after the service, the pastor was greeting church members at the sanctuary door. Three adults apologized for sleeping in church and promised never to do it again. <laughs> so you better not go to sleep this morning. I don't really think I, I don't think I ever remember anybody going to sleep on me except they had some kind of Sleeping disorder. <laughs> Take somebody's hand and say you look so good today. Welcome to my father's house. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We welcome, John, we welcome you this morning. Shirley's friend. Happy to have you with us today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Turn your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, these are scriptures that we've all used in the body of Christ 
and wonderful scriptures as all God's word is. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, I don't know how you particularly preach a Valentine's Day sermon, but I'm going to endeavor this morning to do as close to that as I possibly can, but I trust that it will minister to our hearts. The scripture says for this means wives, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so your wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemishes. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. We are members of his body. And as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Father, I'm thankful as always for your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful words, lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Father, I submit myself to you and I humble myself before you and before our group of people here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you will use my vocal cords, use this flesh and clay to represent the gospel of Christ. And may I speak your word, and may I do it with great love and compassion, and may I totally depend upon you, for that is what I shall do. I, I shall depend completely upon you, because I know I cannot do it, Father, without you. And as always, if there's one individual under my voice today that does not know this wonderful, loving Jesus Christ, May this be their moment in time that they say yes to eternal salvation. And Father, we'll be careful and cautious to always give praise and honor and glory and thanksgiving to that matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. I want to use for a subject title, I don't know, uh, probably most of you here are old enough to remember. In the 60s, Percy Sledge wrote a, a tremendous love song and he entitled it, When a Man Loves a Woman. And I want to use that for a thought this morning, if I could, for a few moments. When a man loves a woman. I've discovered over the years that there are a lot of men and women who really don't know what to expect when a man loves a woman. Many of us have an idea based on what society tells us, but in these scriptures that I have just read, Paul helps us see what really takes place when a man loves a woman. Is there anyone in here today who loves? Are there any married folks in this house this morning who are in love? I need to ask. I wish I was the house was completely full this morning, seriously. This is not. <laughs> I need to ask this question because when I look at these scriptures, I discover that there are a lot of folks who are looking for love in all the wrong places. That's right. Amen. And as a result, they're finding love in fake and fictitious people and places. Amen. In the Greek, and I'm not a uh, 
a Greek theologian, but I'm going to do my best to enunciate these words correctly this morning. But in the Greek, there are four words that explain love. The first word is eros, E-R-O-S, eros, love. It's that sensual and sexual love. It's that love that makes your palms sweat. sweat. It's that affectionate love. The kind that makes your heart go pitter-pat. It's that kind of romantic love that when he walks through the door, there she stands and your heart skips a beat. But, but that's not the kind of love Paul was preaching, teaching about here. But if you're married, there ought to be some romance in your marriage. There ought to be quiet time when no one else is around. There ought to be some time for you to cuddle and tell her how she makes you feel. Tell her how you've been waiting for this moment all day long. But that's not the kind of love that Paul is talking about here. The second is phileos love, P-H-I-L-E-O-S. This is where we get the word Philadelphia. It's a friendship kind of love, but that's not the kind of love Paul's talking about either. Because there are some times when friends will fall out. There are some friends of yours, or so you thought, that you fell out with or they fell out with you. They moved, left town, left no forwarding address, and even changed their cell number. But Paul isn't talking about that kind of fickle friendship love. I want you to listen to this carefully this morning. I believe there's something in this for all of us. Number three is Sergei's love. S-U-R-G-A-S-E. This is a family love. Those with biological connection to you. Paul is not talking about that kind of love either. Because if the truth be told, you have some kinfolk, if it were up to you, you wouldn't even claim them. Amen. You have some cousins, when they show up, you want to run and hide. But because they are biologically tied to you, you put up with them. And since we're being so honest, there are some marriages that only because they've been together so long, some feel like it's cheaper to keep them. <laughs> you think that's not serious, but then that's all right to laugh. But. but that's not what Paul is talking about either. Paul is trying to show us that when a man loves a woman, it ought to be number four, agape love. That's a love that looks beyond my faults and sees my needs. That's a love that gives itself toward me. Because Paul tells us in Romans 5 and 8, while I was yet a sinner, While I was yet a sinner, Jesus Christ died for me. The scripture says us, but I want to make this a personal pronoun this morning. While I was yet in my sins, Christ died for me. What I'm trying to say this morning is, church, when a man loves a woman... He ought to love her, not with an Eros love, not with a Phileos love, not with a Sergei's love, but with an Agape love. What kind of love is it that, demonstrate, that demonstrated man when a man loves a woman? What's Paul trying to get to us, get us to see in verse 25? Husbands, love your wives. Men, I want you to shout that real loud. I know we're kind of outnumbered here. Husbands, love your wives. Yes. Husbands, love your wives. And if I could just say this quickly, I try to share this especially with younger folks that have been married for 
nine or ten hours before they file for divorce the next day. <laughs> you all know this, but come this October the 1st, my wife and I will celebrate our 50th golden anniversary. Yes. Yes. And oftentimes when I say this, I can see people look at me like, Man, you, you must be just one of a kind. I tell people, I love my wife. I'm in love with my wife. And baby, I still like you. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands comes from the Greek word which means a male. Everybody shout a male. Look at somebody say, our society has gone crazy. Husbands comes from the Greek word which means a male species. It's one set apart from being immature. It's a sacrificing love that can only be done by a man. Yes. Amen. Now ladies, you all should have jumped up. I'm talking about what the scripture says. Yes. Whether the world wants to admit it or not, God did create them male and female. Love your wife. Notice Paul uses the, the word your, you. That's a personal pronoun. Paul doesn't say, husbands, love women. He said, but love your wife. Man, I love my wife. Amen. I still get giddy sometimes when she walks through the room. My heart still pitter-pats. <laughs> Since we're all grown people, I told her a couple of weeks ago, I said, Babe, I'm telling you, you still turn me on. <laughs> when a man loves a woman... He can't keep his mind on anything else. That's what the writer of this song, he said. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like a sacrificing love. Because the scripture says, he gave himself. When's the last time, husband, you gave yourself for your wife? I'm not talking about just to have your way. Yeah. But when is the last time you gave yourself for your wife? The word gave here means it comes from the Greek word meaning surrender. Mm -hmm. Simply meaning one who is willing to sacrifice self. Hold on to your seats now. I wish everybody could hear this today. Ladies, we have about a dozen widow women in, in our church. Ladies, don't ever marry a man who is not willing to die for you. Amen. Well, that sounds so good to me hearing myself say that. I'm going to say it again. Ladies, do not ever marry a man who is not willing to die for you. For you. Because a man not willing to die for you is not worthy of you. You see, Jesus laid down his life for the church. And a man who isn't willing to die for you, a man who isn't willing to give his all for you, a man who isn't willing to forsake everything and everybody for you, he's not worthy of you. How am I doing, ladies? Don't you wish the house was full today? I know. Praise <laughs> God. Well, I, I know we're laughing at this, and I knew we would, but oh God, this is so serious. This is extremely serious in the sight of our God. Yes, it is, brother. When I think about a 
When a man loves a woman, I think about Jesus who became a sacrifice for the church. When I think about when a man loves a woman, I think about how Christ exemplifies this kind of love in an excellent manner. Because He saved the church and sac sanctified her unto Him set. How many feel like you're sanctified this morning? You are because of what the husband did. When I think about a man who loves a woman, I think about the perfect one who sustained us in this love affair with Him. Because the Bible says in Matthew 6 and 33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And then He said, Live righteously, and He and Christ, our husband, these are my italics, the man who loves this woman, his wife, the church, will give us everything we'll ever, ever, ever need. When I think about when a man loves a woman, I think about Jesus. Because his love is a securing love. Because I am a witness that he will hold you in the midnight hour. I'm just going to try to share with you what I learned this week in some readings and studies. I read after a pastor... And I, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to verbatim say it just like he said. I, I may not be able to word for word. I should have written it down. But this pastor said this, in essence. He said that when a pastor falls into immoral sin, he said that it was the responsibility of the church because he fell into an immoral sin because the church fail to uphold him. Don't say amen too fast. Because the church failed to a, a pray for him and uphold him in prayer. Can I tell you exactly what I said about that? Bah. I want to tell everybody under my voice this morning, my salvation does not lie in your prayers. Thank you for your prayers. I honor you. I bless you. I commend you. I pray that the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night, that you say, God bless pastor. God keep him. God secure him today. But I want you to know that when a man of God or a woman of God falls by the wayside, they don't fall because you didn't pray for them. They fell because they failed to seek out the Lord God Almighty. They fell by the wayside, not because someone forgot to pray for them, but because they forgot to stay humble on their knees before God and trust God when the tempter come their way. I've been married to the same woman nearly 50 years. I have been faithful to her and to her alone. 30 years ago, she could not, she just about died. I watched her literally just about died. For two years, my wife really could not be a, a full wife to me. But you know what I did? I didn't go get me another woman. I remember what Paul said. Husbands, love your wives. And when I took that sacred covenant with her 50 years ago, I promised God, forget about the preacher, forget about the justice of peace, but I promised God that I would love Shirley, that I would stand by Shirley, no matter what come our way, through sickness, even in death, that I would be totally committed and to commit it to her alone. Yeah. 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 And I say shame on any preacher that will blame the congregation when he falls into some immoral sin because you didn't pray for him. You need to pray for the preacher. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If anybody needs prayer, surely to God, men of God, pastors need prayer. We need it in abundance. But I've got to tell you, this morning, my relationship with the Son of the living God does not depend on you whatsoever. I love you. You know I have great respect for you. But whether you pray for me or not, my relationship with God has nothing to do with your prayers for me. My relationship with God is just that. Hallelujah. Jesus and me are one. Hallelujah. I'm not alone. I'm not insecure. He doesn't leave me in the middle of the night. If anything, he's there right with me. Wrapping his loving arms around me. Embracing me. And saying, son, I love you. Everything is going to be all right. I 
questions. And I said, where's some of these preachers getting this asinine stuff from? Where's it coming from? Our relationship is in Christ. He is the Savior of my soul. He is the Redeemer of mankind. He is the Sanctifier. He is the Holy Ghost Baptizer. He is all and all. He's every, every, everything. Hallelujah. When I think about when a man loves a woman, I thank God for a solid love. Because no matter what you or anyone thinks or says about me, I have a solid love affair with the Lord. I think personally, and I'm so thankful and grateful for my wife. I, I know you hear me say it, but no, I don't think anybody knows how thankful and grateful that I am for my wife, for the love and, and the respect that I have and honor that I, I give to her. And I hope every day, and I hope that she will always recognize that and see that. But there's something about my love affair with Jesus that surpasses my love for my lovely Amen. wife. Amen. Amen. Because it's so solid, I can hear the Apostle Paul saying, Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, of course not, or distress, or persecution, absolutely not, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. He didn't miss anything, did he? I am, men shout, I am persuaded. I am persuaded. I got to go out and beat the brush, girls, get some more men to come in here. <laughs> For I am persuaded. That neither death, nor life, nor angels. Do you hear what he's saying? Nor principalities. Nor pastors that fall by the wayside because their church doesn't uphold them in prayer. Do you catch what I'm saying? I'm going to tell you at the end of life's journey, you're not going to be able to put a finger in anybody's face and say, I'm lost without Jesus because you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do the other. Because our relationship with him is intimate. It's unlike any other relationship. Amen. Amen. No angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depth. Wow. He's, I don't know whether he had a scribe writing for him. If he was writing this himself, he probably got, grew tired. Just <laughs> No any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 8, 35, 38, and 39. I know that we're set up here for the website and, and for the YouTube. But if this gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those that are lost. The first marriage was between a perfect man and a perfect woman. That's when it all began. Adam was a perfect husband. He didn't have any premarital counseling. Help him God just determined that he was going to make himself a man in his image and in his likeness. Yes. Yes. Amen. And so God took a handful of dirt from the earth 
And he began to shape this perfect man. And he worked on him. I, I, I can just imagine God now working in the eye sockets and in his ears and, and his face. I, I, would, I would say that Adam was a, a doggone handsome man. But he was a perfect man. And then he put Adam to sleep. Everybody in here knows that the story of that. Then he put Adam to sleep. He gave him some kind of, uh, just put him to sleep. Yeah, he did it. Then he puts Adam to sleep. He sedates him. And then somehow, miraculously, God takes one of Adam's ribs. Yes. And then God made himself a perfect woman. I mean, she didn't have a flaw. You talking about a man getting excited when Eve walked through the bedroom doors? The garden? Wow. Now you just say with me. Here are two perfect people. Perfect man, a perfect woman. Both extremely handsome. Eve must have been beautiful. Man. They don't say beautiful down south. They say beauty. Beautiful. Eve must have been gorgeous. She must have been a knockout. Because she was a perfect woman. She was a perfect wife. I, I can see y'all looking at me now. You can, because you can't imagine a perfect husband and a perfect wife today. It's just, it's, you know. The last marriage will be between a glorified man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sanctified bride, the church. Between those two weddings, humanity has marred and defaced the institution of marriage in many ways. Yes. Yes. I'm getting ready to tell you something this morning. God is either going to favor us and this country with a man or a woman in the Oval Office that will be a person of integrity that will be a person that will love this country. A person that will, without bias, treat everybody with the same respect. But God is going to give us somebody in the White House that will stand up once again for old traditional marriage. One man, one man, the male, special species, and one woman. And somebody is going to stand up for this tradition once again. Are you hear this preacher this morning? Jesus, just keep your ear pierced to the eastern clouds. Jesus is going to come faster than we thought it was. We're not going to keep going the way we're going. And do you know that one of the, probably the best of the nine Supreme Justices, he went to bed night before last and died. But the Lord Jesus will have the last word. Yes, yes, well, there's a lot I want to say about all of this. Amen. Amen. Male and female. If a great portion of our worldly society could have their way, there'd be no more male and female. Lost, you know, more male and female. I want to tell you right now, God's word is never going to change. Oh, and I'm a little 
anxious about saying this. I just don't care anymore. It has never, ever been the will of God for two men to be married. I'll try to be a little more cautious before I see how many hits I get on this one. Hear me this morning. It never, ever, it doesn't matter how much society changes. It doesn't make a bit of difference. God's word remains the same. It will never be in the sight of God a blessed communion when two women take a sacred covenant. I took a covenant with Shirley 50 years ago. Male and female. Hallelujah. God will never, and I, boy, I know I can, I can get it over this and but pour it on. God will never ever sanction. Sanction. Bless. How can you bless two men? Amen. When a man loves a woman, a woman, and when a woman loves a man, she has no problem submitting herself to that man. Because if he is a man that loves his wife, he will be a man that will stand up for her. He will stand by her. He will die for her. I want to admonish you again this morning, ladies. If the man that you are in love with, if he don't die for you, you run away from him like a typhoid fever. If all he wants to think about is himself. You drop him in the first mud hole. You come by. You kick him to the curb. You let him know that you want a man like Jesus. Oh God, I'm so sick of that. <laughs> the Lord Jesus will have the last, do you hear? He's going to have the last word. Everybody's upset and frightened and concerned about our president putting in a, a liberal to take a Justice Scaly's place. Really about the main one that stood, stands up and stood up for traditional marriage. It doesn't matter if it's 2016. I'm not some old traditional fogey. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what the day and time is. The Word of God is still the Word of God. He created one man and one woman. And he was a perfect husband. And she was a perfect wife. And they weren't looking for anything else. I'm telling you, it can be just about that way again today. If men and women will fall on their faces before God. God and repent of their every sin and accept the Bible, accept the Word of God. He's going to have his last. He's going to have the last word. And I'm saying this for me personally. And I hope that you will take this personally. Until then. Excuse my throat. It's a little scratchy this morning. But until then. I am doing all I can. To make my marriage. Reflect the love of Christ. For his church. And to share the gospel of grace with everyone. It does not matter about your lifestyle. What you used to do. 
Somebody asked Charles Stanley, can a homosexual go to heaven? He said if he gives his heart to Jesus and he's born again and he forsakes his own lifestyle and submits to the word of God, anybody can go to heaven. We're not against homosexuals. I'm not against a lesbian. I'm not against a heroin addict. I'm not against a liar or cheater. And I'm here to preach to you this morning that this Jesus that loves this woman, this body, he died for us to cleanse us, to sanctify us, to wash us in his precious blood. Not that we can go crazy. I haven't heard yet. And I think Percy Sledge died, I believe, last year, battling with cancer. I am surprised that this liberal bunch, I don't give a flip about being politically correct. You know I don't. I don't. I didn't care when it first started. I didn't care a year ago, and I don't care this morning. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering when that group, that liberal society of ours, is going to take offense at this song. When a man loves a woman. You know this. I would die cold graveyard dead for you right now. That's the way Jesus feels about us. He did die cold graveyard dead. Couldn't hold him but just a few days until he came out of there. But listen to me this morning. He is going to have the last word. No hand wringing. No fear. No hatred. No bitterness. Stop accusing the people of God from being homophobic, unkind, and bitter just because we all made a conscientious, deliberate decision years ago to comply with and to submit ourselves to what this wonderful book says. Amen. But no hand wringing, no fear, no hatred, no bitterness. Just the love of my Savior. Just the love of truth. Just the love of my wife. Just the love of the Lord's, for the love of the Lord's church. The love of all of my neighbors. All of my neighbors. Though many things in our culture has definitely changed. Oh God. It's just almost, I feel like sometimes I've been, that Scotty transported me up to some other earth. I do. I feel like sometimes God, we, we, we just been, of course, we're getting ready to be transported. <laughs> well, we're not going to need any help from anything man made, but we're just going to leave here. Though there are many things in our culture have definitely changed. And I know everyone sitting under my voice this morning, you're not satisfied with traditional marriage being changed. You're not satisfied. I heard something the other day that they're trying to do away with the language or with the word mom and dad. Can you imagine what kind of children we're going to raise if they can't tell a mom from a dad? Or if they've got two or three daddies living in the same room, same home, or they've got two or three mommies that are living. Can you imagine what type of general... Did you hear me this morning? What... I don't know what to do with this one. I'm just... <clears throat> I believe with all my heart that there's a church we used to preach this years ago, but I'm believing it more tonight than I ever dreamed, this morning, than I've ever dreamed. 
I believe that God Almighty has a church that's in this denominational circle. I believe that Jesus, I believe he has a bride, a real bride. And please, I don't mean to be scolding Donald Trump. I don't want him giving me a right jab. But he said on national TV last night during the debate in that portion, he made reference to himself. He said, I am a good Christian. Now, he may make a good president. I don't know. And I'm not here for any applause or smacks about him. I'm here to tell you that there are Christians, there are blood-bought children of God that are confined, contained in this worldwide church that are going to make a firm stand. They're not going to back off from the devil. He can rant and rave and curse and swear. He can threaten us all he wants to, but we're going to love our wives like Christ loved the church. We're going to embrace truth that the Holy Ghost of God inspired great men of old to write for our learning, for our understanding, for our correction, for our furtherance of our journey through life until we get to that wonderful place called heaven. It doesn't matter what they do. They can say what they want to say. He has got a bride that soon the trumpet of God is getting ready to sound. And soon gravitation will lose of the body of Christ and we will be presented right into the presence of the Lamb of God. Our spouse, husband. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just tired. I'm tired of hearing this crazy stuff. Somebody has got to stand up. I've been telling God for weeks, even months. I said, Lord, I feel so strong about this, but I have such a small platform. I don't know what God precisely outside of I know He's coming. I don't know how God is really going to work the church through this mess. There are several good candidates that are probably qualified. But I want to tell you this morning, if we don't get God back in our marriages, if we don't get Jesus Christ back in our schools, if we don't get him back in our homes, if we don't get him back in our government, I'm not here to tell you this morning that I believe that a real born again man of God has to be the president, but I do believe there has to be someone that will take over the Oval Office at the beginning of 2017 that will have a heart for the people of God and for our belief, for our principles, because we cannot live by the principles of this world, church. You can't be saved and live by the principles of this world. This world is dead. have to be able to witness to Donald Trump. You don't know what I give to witness to some preachers that I know. If we don't get God back in this country, don't boo me, don't shut me down. But if we don't get God and the Holy Spirit back into our country, back into our constitution that was built on in God we trust. If we don't see some great changes and soon and very soon, it's not going to be too late for you and me, but it's going to be too late for our country. Jesus loves the lost too much. 
He loves America too much to allow her to continue. Some of you said it here this morning, 30 years ago, if someone would have suggested to you that there would be lifestyles for individuals that said that they were saved and said that they were born again. If someone told some of you 30 years ago that in our not too distant future that America and the supreme justice would give legions to and allow same-sex marriage, some of you sitting here this morning, if not all of you, you would have given them a smirk. That ain't happening. Amen. I can tell you I did. I would have. Yeah. And I'm still kind of scratching my head to see whether I'm awake or asleep to believe that we have gotten in such a cold, godless, godless yeah. Yeah. America is and was based on Christianity. But our country is not a godly country. But the man that loved this woman You remember me saying that? I've been sharing some things with my wife this past week. I believe it's a God. I believe it's God. And I've shared some things with her. I don't want to just be too bold and outspoken about it this morning. But I'm here to tell you right now, some point in time, God's going to look over at Jesus. He's going to say, Son, now the time's up. And I'm not going to speak to Jesus, but I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I can imagine Jesus saying, Oh, Father, thank you. Oh, yeah. When I saw Shirley walk in church that day, whew. when God says to Jesus, Time's up, son. I want you to go collect your bride. And if I can understand it correctly, if I understand it correctly, according to Isaiah, multiple scriptures, that when God tells the Holy Ghost to alert the dead who have died in Christ, yes. and He says to His precious, precious Son, who is our husband, espoused husband, the covenant's already been made, the agreement, I've already signed the agreement. When she walked down that church that day, just a 17-year-old kid. What's a 17-year-old kid know about being married? Nothing. <laughs> but when I saw that gal walk down that aisle, oh, you're talking about your heart pitter pattern. I thought, oh, Lord, she's mine. I thought, Lord, oh, how gorgeous she is. I thought, Lord, she's so beautiful. <laughs> I won't tell you everything, but I... I'm thinking, I can't wait to get her out of here. <laughs> but if you think that I was anxious to be with her, when God says, son, it's time to consummate the marriage. And when the trumpet sounds and the people of God lose gravitation and we leave this world, I don't know about you. I, I don't want to die, but I, I sometimes I can't only wait for Jesus to come. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. I catch myself saying, Come, Jesus. You just come today. What a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. I can't even preach right this morning. But through long say. But this is if I understand it correctly, there's going to be a marriage supper. That's right. Yeah. I'm just going to say seven years, that's the way that I understood it and was taught it and so on and so forth. But, uh, uh, but before we just get on that eternal trip with the Lord, endless ages in heaven, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've just begun. But the bridegroom is going to take the bride somewhere in the heavenly. Somebody said, well, where is that? I don't really know. And if you don't mind me sounding ignorant, I don't really care. I just want to be with the bridegroom. And for some seven years, I understand that when we leave this planet, when the church is raptured, and I know you got the naysayers, I don't care. Me either. Believe it or not, believe it. But 
for seven years. The marriage supper will already be prepared. And the bridegroom, I believe we're all going to be seated at our place. So you can't figure this out logically. It's too much for your brain. So don't even try to figure it out logically. It's a, you can't figure God out logically. You, you can't figure out how the supernatural almighty creator just took some dirt from the earth and made himself a man. And even beyond that put him to sleep, sedated him and took a rib out of the man's rib cage and made him a woman and presented him to That's what it's going to be. Jesus, we, we, he's going to present us to himself a glorious bride. He's going to serve us. He's going to tend to us. He's going to take care of us. You've got to get your mind. You, you, you've got to get off, off logic. You can't figure this out. Logic. But I'm here to tell you that this is what's going to happen. If we don't get a turnaround here in our not too distant future. Remember the preacher saying this. If we don't get a turnaround in our government. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Russia. I'm not talking about somewhere else. I'm talking about America. If our wonderful, blessed, I love this country, I love this nation. With all of our problems and concerns, we're still the greatest place to live on this planet. But at some point in time, if the church, and I believe we are standing up. How many of you noticed in just recent months? I've noticed, and I tell my wife, and I, I applaud them. Whether you're a fan of Marco Rubio or not, it doesn't matter to me. But what he said on, in one of those national debates about a month ago, when he made it personal, the pronoun, I am thankful that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and my personal Savior. I applauded him. Thank God. I was hoping this is just going to be a quick one this morning, but we've got to have some help. And I hope you will join me. It is my plans, my personal plans, to help us. Look at somebody say, I want to help us. I want to help the body. Not promoting or advocating bitterness, homophobic. Hate, all that stuff's going to be behind us. That's, that's what's destroying the world now. But the church of Jesus Christ is going to make her stand. And Jesus is going to be so pleased to hear his father say, Go get your bride, son. She's ready. She's prepared. I'm not going to fight politicians. I'm not going to be ugly and unkind about anybody. I have my own opinion. You all know I have my own opinion. And I'm going to express my opinion. And if you ask me about someone, either be ready to allow me to be humble and honest with you, or don't ask me. Hallelujah. Many things, in closing, in our culture, in our culture has definitely changed. Everything in the Word of God remains the same. I personally take great consolation in that fact. Great consolation in that fact. I said last week or two, I said, and we all know this and understand this, right now, God knows who is going to be the new president of these United States. Come November, whichever way you and I vote, he already knows. And my honest to God conviction is, God is going to raise someone up that's going to help the church so we can have some more time to preach the gospel and preach it freely without having to run and hide and go underground having prayer meetings and if it comes to that we'll do whatever we have to do 
But I am of the personal honest to God conviction that God is getting ready to do something that we've never, ever, ever, ever seen before. God's getting ready to act and I can look at some of you faith. You don't believe that. You better believe it. Do you actually think Barack Obama is in charge? Do you actually think if we vote Donald Trump in that he's going to be in charge? I'm t it's getting too late in the day to depend on any government or any one single man. But in closing, I'm talking about God is either going to put somebody in there that will give us some more leverage and the body of Christ is going to keep standing and being strong. We're not going to hide behind closed doors. Preachers, we're not going to be afraid to preach the unadulterated, inerrant, everlasting word. We're going to proclaim it with power and with authority. And God's going to set somebody that will do what's right if he don't do what's right for anybody else, he's going to do what's right for Christ's bride. I, 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 I just deserve it. Everybody's not agreeing with that. I, you're going to fall through the cracks if you're not careful. Would you stand? When a man loves a woman, Church, we've never had anybody to love us like Jesus loves us. Amen. I know my wife is grateful for the love I've shown her. And I do show my wife love. I don't talk about it. I show my wife love. I open the door and let her help her to get in and out of the car. I show my wife love. I talk love to her. I cuddle with her. I talk sweet nothings to her. And I love her. But the true bridegroom, Jesus the Christ, loves her so much more than I do. I guess everyone in here is saved. But if you're here today and you do not know the Lord, you don't have a personal relationship with God, I would invite you to this altar. I would invite you this morning to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Lord, I thank you this morning for your sweet holy presence. I thank you this morning, God, that you are God. Lord, you're not going to let us down. We have despair all around us. And we all recognize, Lord, that our world, our country is in trouble. But Lord, we also realize that you have a church right now that's preparing herself, making herself ready. And Lord, nothing is going to be able to stop that. No man, no government, no nation, nothing is going to stop your church from being prepared. Because you have foreordained her to be glorious to be blameless. You have foreordained your love, the church, when a man loves a woman. Thank you, Lord, for loving us the way you do. Speak to all of our hearts this morning, Lord. I realize, God, that we all are dealing with the troubles, the trials of life. I realize, God, that there are times that we ourselves feel despair, feel like, Lord, what else can we do? But when we have this man called Jesus that loves this woman called his bride, we thank you for that knowledge this morning, God. Thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do. In my closing prayer, Lord, may I ask you to bless our country. I ask you, God, to bless all of these men and women all of these men and women, God, that have made their appeal to become the leader of our country. I pray, Father, that some way, somehow, the thing that you do best, Lord, that's work miracles, 
God, everybody knows our country needs a miracle. So Father, would you take these men and women and would you handpick one of them? Would you select one of them, Lord? I know what the world says. I know what the political arena says. I understand the voting process and so on and so on. But God, this really is your world because you created it. And it's swiftly coming to an end. So Lord, I trust you and we ask you together this morning to clear the way. Clear the way, Lord. Choose the right people to help us that we may promote the gospel with great fervency. And Lord, if not, then we know that you're coming because you're not going to leave us. You're not going to forsake us. So we're just going to pray and trust you. So speak to all of our hearts today. Lord, I will be careful and cautious to praise and magnify that lovely, matchless, beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior.